Come the mid-2000s, there was a major rise in core counts, dual cores, quad cores, and of course tri-core CPUs, but the latter of which faded into obscurity pretty quick, so join me today as we find out how they came to be and if they actually did age any better than their dual core counterparts. This right here is an AMD Phenom X3-8600B, one of the first tri-core CPUs released under the AMD name. In fact, the 8600B was the one that OEMs like Dell, HP and the others opted to use in their systems. It's fairly representative of the most early tri-cores with it released in mid-2008, being based on the 65nm K10 architecture. The same as most standard generation chips from this era that came from AMD and were based on the Phenom lineup. It came with, and you guessed it, three cores which clocked in at 2.3GHz and it does luckily utilise L3 cache. It only has 2MB on board but still that's actually quite usable and is quite nice considering the Athlon chips didn't actually have this. It doesn't have an iGPU but lots of chipsets of the era actually included some sort of basic Nvidia GeForce 6100 or the likes and you know the types that they were included because I've used them plenty on the channel and they're not all too good. Being a business based chip the CPU is known to use around 50 to 70 watts under full load so it actually had quite a lot going for it. But you're forgetting, this is the era of the legendary Core 2 Duo and Core 2 Quad, so why don't we put together a little system to benchmark and discuss a little bit of history about the 3 core series. Now come this era of CPUs, AMD had already released the original Phenom lineup of quad cores and stuff like that, and most review sites had noted that it wasn't a bad buy, but that was only after the price had been cut to make sure it was able to differentiate itself from the Intel Core series counterparts, and even the main area it showed any incentive to buy was to content creators and multitaskers who needed cores. Now you have to remember that content creators weren't exactly as prolific now as they were back then. So you have to keep that in mind that it wasn't actually as useful as say the AMD Ryzen series makes over say a Coffee Lake CPU. Now this was also the same for the Core 2 Quad series at the time as the dual cores usually worked out better unless you're encoding in the background. So if you had the money you really had the choice between an AMD Phenom or a Core 2 Quad if you were doing some intensive tasks that really utilised more than two cores. Because not many games really did in this era, it wasn't until the 2010 era that we started to see games really touching more than those first two cores. And during the release of these, well some games even only touched one core. So the Core 2 duos sold like hotcakes and the AMD dual cores still outsold the Phenom series as well. So a year after this AMD released the updated quad cores, but to try and incorporate a more budget offering for those who didn't need the full multitasking performance of a quad core, but could do with a core to hang back in case it was needed for any multi-threaded workloads, all the while allowing AMD to get rid of their quad cores with a less defective core, essentially meaning that they could ship off CPUs that couldn't actually be sold as a quad core because they weren't good enough. So came along the Tri-Core Phenom series, and ultimately they have a lot of benefits from being Phenom chips, such as being able to actually use RAM without having issues posting, without hours on end spent trying to get two sticks to actually work, unlike their 775 counterparts, saying that's only gotten worse with age, as any of you that have actually tried testing them know that they can be awfully picky. Now I will actually say that is one major benefit they did have, memory compatibility on these Phenom chips is lovely. They had the same relative IPC games, power efficiency, technology and other pioneers nearing advancements as the Phenom series, with the catch being that lower price and of course lower core counts, which could actually be unlocked on certain Phenom series CPUs. In fact it's one of the reasons people bought them, you know, to try and get lucky and unlock a fourth core for a fraction of the price back in the day, it actually had a value incentive. Unfortunately I'm not going to be messing around with that today, but it was one of the incentives to buy them because you could get a quad core for a lower price. So at the end of the day, some OEMs offered them in barebones systems, which is where mine came from. In fact, you might remember it from that 50 subscriber special I ended up doing a while ago, as well as some people buying them from that value incentive. So you occasionally see one floating around. But the thing is, they aren't anywhere near as common as a Core 2 Duo, and that's ultimately because the Core 2 Duos were a better buy. In fact, with the release pricing, you could get a Core 2 Quad and see more performance for only a percentage more of your money. So there was very little reason to buy one of these new. Ultimately though, these were the poor man's multi-core CPUs of the mid-2000s if you weren't willing to buy used or spend a little bit more. So, should you buy one today? You know, what if you actually have one? How do they perform? And if you bought one back in the day, was it a better option over that Core 2 Duo? Because we've already seen how those have fared. So, what can you actually do with it in 2019?
Now, I always like to touch on this before we actually get ahead with the benchmarks. We're going to be testing on a fairly basic test system with 4GB of DDR2 800MHz RAM, a 120GB SSD, and a GTX 770. I've also tested this with an AMD Fury and even an R5 240 to make sure that we see very similar results all round, and I can confirm that we will see the exact same results all round. Now, before anyone comes in to say that RAM is definitely going to be a major impact, I also did test with 8GB of RAM using a spare motherboard, but that wasn't mine. Even and then I saw zero difference in terms of performance in terms of frame times and average frame rates. The main difference you'll see with 8GB of RAM is heavily multitasking and gaming improvements while you're doing this. Now with 4GB you'll be seeing the exact same performance but I wasn't running anything in the background and it's a fairly basic OS install of Windows 7. Not that you'll be seeing any difference in terms of the footage so you're just going to be seeing your standard Phenom X3 running on new games. So why don't we see if we can get things running Running. You know, the issue that was going on in the background and why I had so much footage is because I had to perform an intense ritual of adding a DVD drive just so Windows would install, but you know, that's how it can be with these older motherboards. Anyway, with that all out of the way, why don't we get on with the benchmarks? As for your older AAA titles like Skyrim, well, they run absolutely fine in all instances, mainly because this is the era where all cores began to get some use. But the games could still function fine on a dual core or single core CPU. It's just that those increased core counts actually helped out at this point. We saw virtually 60 FPS throughout all the time playing the game, except when engaging in combat in heavy towns and cities. Of course, you'd still see a bit of a drop down to the 45 to 55 FPS region, but it's still perfectly smooth, and I still managed to play a nice little bit of the game through on this. I didn't test the latest in Bethesda's RPG lineup, but I'd imagine they might be a lot less stable than Skyrim is. Next of all was GTA 5, which was a nearly consistent 30 FPS, but could drop down in heavy gunfights and car chases. In fact, it played very similar to the original Xbox 360 version of the game, which personally I found to be quite a playable, although not ideal, experience overall. And the experience comparison, you know, is quite apt considering the console actually had a tri-core CPU itself. Overall, not a terrible experience, and definitely better than the Core 2 Duo was in terms of stability, which is something I'll be saying quite a bit. So the game was playable, although it would tend to dip below 30 FPS during gameplay. Following on from this we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which is more about seeing just how well it copes with those super modern and up to date titles, for comparison's sake against modern CPUs in 2019. And we saw FPS that went from single digits to over 30 FPS, I mean it was actually quite surprising how well it did. Overall it was completely unplayable, and the frame times were all over the place. But it was still a surprising revelation that a CPU could actually start this game and get into it while being relatively smooth. And by relatively smooth I mean smooth in those simple instances, but you know what I mean, it was actually surprising how far this CPU could go with this game. Titles like PUBG and Apex Legends will not work on a CPU like this, as unlike the Core 2 series, I believe they lack the correct instruction sets, meaning that you can make it through to the menus sometimes, but as soon as you try and get into a game, it will promptly crash. Similarly to when you tried to get it to run on an old Pentium 4 or something like that, it just lacks the instruction sets for those modern titles that actually make calls to them. So for your battle royale needs, you're better off with something like that CSGO alternative, or Minecraft Hunger Games, or something like that. When you go to older indie titles like KSP, which are a little bit old now but still utilize cores quite efficiently, well, they saw an average frame rate hovering around the 40 to 60 FPS region. Now, I'm not going out here to claim that it's going to run perfectly all of the time, especially if you're going to build some stupidly large multi stage spaceships, and there were definitely some hitches here or there. But I would say that, you know, with these CPUs, the late games are always going to be a bit of a struggle, but in the early to mid game, these things are able to run these games absolutely fine. Back to the world of indie titles to finish us off with, and with Rocket League, which is incredibly easy to run and nicely optimised, we saw 81 FPS on average, which was perfectly smooth and coherent in all match types throughout all the games I tested. Even the most intensive scenes in the game showed no signs of slowdown, as reflected by those healthy frame times. So even for those indie titles which are always not too intensive, but are also able to use multiple cores, you know, this Phenom 3 core has actually aged quite nicely, as there are titles out there that are simple to run, but can utilise the additional power of the third core, something it has over a dual core CPU. Mm -hmm. 
And just because I like to throw it in wherever possible, with games like RimWorld, which ran perfectly fine and smooth, you know, it, these types of games that are still heavily single-threaded will run, although when it comes to speeding up the game, the game will struggle because, of course, the CPU's biggest weakness in 2019 is exactly the same as when it came out. Weaker single-threaded performance. So when that core isn't being used, you're stuck with essentially, you know, a dual core or maybe a single core of worth of performance, which is worse than the comparative Intel Core 2 Duo chips. So of course the game ran, but when it came to speeding it up, it wasn't very nice. Now a game that surprised me a lot was CSGO. Now if you've been watching my channel a while, you know that this game is quite bloated nowadays and isn't pleasant on this era of CPUs, specifically the Core 2 Duo era of CPUs, seeing awful frame times overall despite a nearly competitive average. You know, the fact is that you will see a constant 60 FPS on the average, but the frame time's usually awful. But with this CPU, you know, we saw a near constant 60 FPS on average and it stuck to it. Of course you get the usual drops down in smoke and heavy gunfights, but there was nothing too bad to the stage where it was unplayable. and. Quite Quite honestly, I was surprised how playable this was for a 3 core CPU, as that extra core just seems to kick in and keep that frame rate smooth, something that the Core 2 Duo era of CPUs just isn't from my experience. Next of all, as a follow-up to this, we saw City Skylines, which is a great game if you want to push a CPU to its limit. So with the medium-sized city benchmark, we saw that modern simulation titles are not really a great shout to run on this CPU, and that extra core tries its best, but the CPU is going to be pegged at 100% and shows no signs of being able to push out any more frame rates at all. So newer entirely CPU-bound titles like this are definitely not playable given how intensive they are. Emulation wise, because you guys love to see just how well these old CPUs hold up, well, you know, it was no surprise that the GameCube era stuff will run as long as it's not the most intensive stuff on the platform. Although I would say, when you aim for the Wii and newer consoles, you know, these things do not have the single threaded performance of a Core 2 Duo chip. So the Core 2 Duo has actually worked out a better choice. Of course, this is purely for the need for single threaded performance in most types of emulation. It'll also be worth adding that pretty much all handhelds of the early 2000s will run fine. Older consoles like the PS1 will run absolutely fine. But that's usually a given considering that the, those aren't very difficult to emulate, at least not in 2019. So, you know, as long as you stop emulating around the Wii, maybe the... Uh, the GameCube era, as long as they're a simple title, you should be alright. During 3D Mark, of course, we saw that the CPU compared to a modern Athlon 5350, which is either a compliment to this CPU for comparing to something so modern, or an insult to the poor performance of the 5350, which I also have a video on if you want to see just how badly it aged. But that, of course, is a CPU designed for media centers, not for a dedicated gaming PC, despite the fact some of you used it for that. Ultimately, both came in better than a Core 2 Duo due to that extra core, which is something you'd expect, although do keep in mind that those Core 2 Duos clock stupidly high and could definitely overtake this should you do some overclocking. So in conclusion once again, the old triple cores, a way for AMD to meet the needs of the standard PC user and the enthusiast at the same time, with a product that was innovative and easy to use in some regards, at least in terms of compatibility. Ultimately though, it fell short of the needs of the time because they were too expensive, and even when the price did drop, you know, well, you might as well get a cool to do if you're gaming because those dropped in price as well. They haven't exactly aged particularly well, but they haven't aged badly. You know, they are still holding up okay a decade later, and I was able to use one completely fine. But then again, you know, the Intel offerings are, within reason, holding up equally as well, provided we're talking about the quad cores, not the dual cores. You know, it's a viable performer even in today's titles. But as long as they're indie titles, it's never going to hold up with the AAA titles, which really, you know, you have to stop around the 2014-2015 era, and even then you have to make sure they're optimized titles. Would I recommend buying into a system like this? Well, no. The four cores are virtually the same price and better in every way than these three cores. And even then, we're talking about sub £30 builds when I'm talking about this, because anything more than that, well, unless you're going for the retro ideas, 
well, just get an 1155 Intel system, you know. An i3 or an i5 is going to cost about the same as long as it's in a pre-built. Even if it's just a cheap build by itself, I'd rather go for that option because the upgradability on that platform is insane. If you've actually got one of these, well, you know, they're actually nippy on the desktop and they're fine for video playback. I was using this for about, you know, three, five days just to try and get around for day-to-day -day tasks and get an idea of just how it was to use, especially compared to their Intel equivalents, you know. And I actually found this to be, you know, even better than the Core 2 Duos when it came to desktop usage today because it has that extra core and I was impressed by how well an 11-year-old tri-core CPU held up. So I hope this video has actually been useful. I don't recommend you buy one for modern use. Maybe if you're a retro gamer they'll play everything fine. But I hope you've learned something today about these CPUs and how they came into play, why people may have bought them, and why you should probably avoid buying these things today. Thank you very much for watching this video. Good night. So I tried to do another history orientated video because you guys apparently like that. If you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always like and subscribe, support us on Patreon, follow Twitch when I actually live stream on some of this old hardware. You know, it's up to you. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.